All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final uh, course lecture for the class. I uh, hope you all are having a great day today. Uh, tomorrow we will meet. Uh, we will cover the Technology Guide chapter, or not chapter three, but the Technology Guide three for cloud computing. Um, so certainly tune in for that. Uh, but apart from that, you know, in terms of the chapter lectures, this is the final one. Um, so today we'll be covering telecommunications and networking, as well as chapter eight, which is going to be wireless uh, communication. Uh, we're going to go ahead and apologize in advance if you hear any sort of background noise today. Um, they're having some meetings and stuff, and they're also doing some, uh, you know, minor construction inside the office suite. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize for that if you hear anything in the background. Um, but yeah, so basically just kind of start things off today. We'll be starting with the chapter six. I think on the schedule it starts with chapter eight, but I just think it's more logical to start with a kind of broader concept of a computer network. Um, so that's what we're starting with. We're going to cover basics of computer networking, um, some fundamental technologies, cover a little bit about the internet itself, as well as some different applications we can use with uh, networks. So it's just the most basic level here. Uh, it's important to kind of be able to define some key elements of you know network usage and network speed. So the first one here is probably going to be what you think of when you think of a traditional metric of speed for a network. It's going to be bandwidth. And this is where we're going to take uh, the amount of bits going across a device divided by a time period. So, you know, the most basic kind of SI unit of this is going to be bits per second. But that's not really common to see anymore because bits are pretty small. Uh, you're more likely to see something like megabits per second or gigabits per second. Um, sometimes you'll see kilobits per second, but that's going to be pretty small. So it's just going to be some uh, way to see how much network can pass over a network in a given time. That's all this is. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there's certain uh, kind of marketing terms that go along with that. The FCC, for example, puts out a term called broadband. And currently it's sitting at 25 megabits per second down, uh, 4 megabits per second upload. So that's basically saying that if you have that, that's considered to be broadband. Now, broadband can also mean another thing. Uh, it can also mean that the cable is capable of having more than a single uh, type of signal pass through it at a time. So there's different definitions for broadband. Uh, just make sure that you're aware of the FCC definition, though. Uh, and then in addition to that, another important concept in networking is the idea of latency. And latency is simply the time from which you send a signal to the time in which you receive a response. So for example, if you're sitting next to someone and they, they tell you something and you wait two seconds to tell them something back, that's a two second latency. Uh, but if someone tells you something and then you immediately respond, that's an immediate you know, kind of response. So there's not going to be a lot of latency. Uh, but you know, in terms of networking, we'd want to see that probably f uh, below 100 milliseconds. Uh, depending on the application, uh, it's not going to be harmful to go above that. Uh, but certainly for anything doing real time, um, if you're doing a phone call, anything below 500 milliseconds is probably going to be too much. Uh, if you're doing you know, any sort of online gaming, you definitely want to keep it under 100 milliseconds. Uh, but if you're doing you know, basic web browsing, you know, the amount of latency is probably not as important of a consideration. So depending on the type of network you're on, uh, this can be more or less important. So speaking of different types of networks, let's kind of go over some of these basic ones here. Um, I'll go ahead and point out to you, uh, you see this asterisk beside local area network and wide area network. Uh, those are the two you're likely to see exam questions over. But there's really a lot more uh, kind of considerations. So let's just go through each of these. So a personal area network would be a network designed for one person. Uh, and typically, this would only comprise you know, three or four devices, maybe things like a laptop, uh, maybe a smartphone, and you know, maybe a tablet, or just a couple devices that kind of communicate with each other um, across just a small network. Uh, that's going to be contrasted with a local area network, which is going to be a similarly small network designed for maybe several people's devices to communicate, probably you know, 50, 100 devices on a local area network. Uh, that's going to contrast pretty greatly with a wide area network where it's going to be maybe an entire building, maybe an entire company having all their devices on a single network. And of course, we're talking about you know even larger networks than that. We have campus area networks where we're looking beyond one building. You know, we're actually seeing an entire kind of conglomeration of you know buildings all on the same network. Um, you know, a good example of that, of course, would be like a university. Uh, there's going to be a campus area network where where basically any device that's on the campus can connect to it. 
Uh, and then lastly, we have metropolitan area network. This isn't even necessarily for a single organization. Uh, this would instead be like if a city wanted to set up some sort of municipal broadband service. Uh, that'd be an example of metropolitan area network. Uh, additionally, uh, it'd be like, I think New York City did this for a while. I'm not sure if they still do or not. But they actually provided uh, some sort of free uh, Wi-Fi to residents to be able to use. So, you know, basically just what you kind of see is as you go from personal area network to metropolitan area network, the size of the network increases. But really, the only key distinction that I would ever test on is the difference between a local area network and a wide area network. Uh, because, you know, in practice, it can be difficult to distinguish a wide area network from, say, a campus area network. Um, you know, it's kind of a blurry line there. And it'd be very difficult to come up with a test question that could even, you know, kind of uh, be able to distinguish that. So just to kind of keep things nice and simple. Uh, we're not going to, you know, to really test over the difference between any of these except for local area network and wide area network. But, you know, probably more important than that for this class is to understand some of the basic enterprise technologies that we can use to provide, you know, more robust network, to provide a safer network, and also to provide a more functional network for a wide range of devices. So with that in mind, it's important to kind of note that, you know, most enterprises, they don't have a single device that's going to be on the network. You know, they have, you know, various smartphones they allow on. They have, you know, various desktop computer devices. They have, um, you know, all sorts of devices, possibly even things like access control devices, you know, cameras. Those are all going to be on a network. So, you know, to kind of best serve those wide range of devices, it's important we have technologies that are, can adapt to that. And we can, uh, you know, best reach out to them with Signal, uh, ensure that they have appropriate, you know, amounts of bandwidth available to them. Lots of different considerations like that. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. We're dealing with literally thousands of devices on a single network. It can get kind of congested. So we want to have policies to alleviate that congestion. Uh, for example, if we had a network, we would probably have separate VLANs for uh, things like cameras. So they have uh, a good amount of bandwidth all the time. Uh, and of course, a VLAN is just a segmented, uh, virtually segmented network of you know whatever you have on it. So, you know, You'd probably do that with things like cameras, probably also do that with things like access control to give them a dedicated network so that way other things can't communicate with them uh, unless you wanted them to communicate with them. So there's lots of different uh, ways to go about it. There's no right answer to what you would do here. Uh, but you know, in addition to that, we'd also have things like some sort of a uh, kind of distribution of the thing. We typically would call that distribution a backbone. So basically we have a place where our internet service is coming in we're going to have a uh, border router, which would typically be called. And then that border router is going to send the signal out to our individual switches and basically allow everything to communicate. Uh, that's all going to be done on the backbone. We're going to keep it nice and simple. Um, but, you know, I talked about security. And one of the most basic things we could do with security is to make sure we're having passwords on stuff. So we're talking about passwords for networks, uh, we can basically use whatever sort of existing credentials our, uh, our place of business has. So for example, uh, a lot of places use Active Directory to manage credentials, you know, usernames and passwords for signing into Windows. Well, you can also use those to sign into your network with. That's using a technology called radius authentication. And, you know, basically the whole premise is that you don't have to create uh, separate wireless account passwords. Instead, you just use your standard account password. It's going to enhance security because people already know their standard user account password. Additionally, you can monitor employees in that way. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, but it certainly does enhance the firm's ability to uh, make sure that their employees are visiting appropriate sites and not visiting anything inappropriate. Uh, the specific IEEE standard that refers to this is going to be IEEE uh, 802.1x. Um, and this kind of goes through some of the different things. Uh, you really don't have to know too much about it or anything for this class, because again, this is covering for managerial concepts. But certainly be aware of you know, what radius authentication is. It's just using uh, predetermined usernames and passwords to you know, authenticate it for, to access the network. Uh, but then, you know, one of the largest considerations for an enterprise network in particular is having redundant infrastructure in place. So it's not uncommon 
whenever you're purchasing enterprise network gear to purchase twice the amount of gear that you actually need. So for example, if you had a building that you needed to have, let's say 48 ethernet drops in the building, instead of just purchasing one 48 port ethernet switch, you'd go ahead and purchase two. And the reason for that is that you would want to ensure that you had excess capacity in the event that you had a problem with one of the switches. Uh, you know, no, in, no uh, equipment's going to be infallible, so you go ahead and stick twice what you need on the rack, um, allowing you to easily change uh, the equipment out as needed. So that's just some basic kind of overview of some considerations for Enterprise Network. Any questions so far? Certainly feel free to uh, jump in with any questions. Uh, but here's some of the, here's just kind of a, one example of what this could look like inside of an enterprise. So at the center here, we have the core. Uh, we probably have a border router on there somewhere where the internet signal is coming in. And, you know, there's, this really emphasizes the nature of redundancy. So we take the, the signal, we send it out to different distribution points, and then ultimately those distribution points are going to provide ports to allow us to access the network with our uh, end devices. So that's pretty much what's happening here is that we just have, you know, the network coming in, we send it out to distribution centers, and you know, ultimately our devices use it. So you know, this is quite common to see inside of a building where you have like a network closet. That's going to be a distribution point. There's going to be probably a 48-port switch in there, sometimes more ports, depending on what the building needs. And basically, you're just going to be, uh, each of those uh, ports are going to be used to send a network drop to a specific location within the building. So. Uh, it's pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, how that works. You have, you know, some place where the network's coming in, you want to distribute it, and then ultimately, you know, it's going to go to the end users there. Uh, but again, you know, this is not something you'll have to draw on a test. You won't even really see a question uh, where you are asking uh, anything based upon this. But certainly to understand the principle behind, you know, having redundant access to things is very important. So enough about the enterprise uh, technologies there. Uh, certainly, if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, there are several enterprise networking classes you could take. Uh, but you know, I assume a lot of people probably are not so interested in it. Uh, and that's OK. But certainly understanding the basic enterprise concepts are important from a managerial perspective. So in addition to that, there, there's really two main ways we can actually communicate over a network. We could use a cable, or we could also use a wireless signal, or another word for that is going to be broadcast. And you know those are going to differ in a couple different ways. So with a cable, uh, we know exactly where the signal's going. And it's, for the most part, not going to be open to be intercepted. That's not to say that there are not exceptions to that. Um, you know, there certainly are. But most of the time, cables are going to be considered to be secure enough for pretty much anything you'd put across it. Uh, you know, depending on the type of cable, it is possible to uh, intercept what's going across it, but it's unlikely. Uh, that's going to contrast with broadcast media. Uh, broadcast media, as the name implies, gets broadcast to a large uh, area, and you, know, you, you may not actually be in a place that is, you know, uh, using it actively, but if you had an access point sitting inside of a building, you know, and someone outside the building could theoretically access the information going across it. So there's different technologies that we would use to, you know, kind of mitigate that problem. And we'll get into that when we talk about broadcast media. But for now, we're going to focus on cable media and some of the different types of cables. So uh, I disagree with the book, uh, some of the stuff it talks about different cables being faster or slower, uh, just based on the material that they're made of. Uh, and the reason I disagree with that is because it highly depends upon the spec of the cable itself. So if you're using a cable that is high spec, uh, it can certainly be faster than a low spec cable of a different type. So uh, I would never ask a test question, which cable is the fastest? Because that it depends on the specification of the cable. I certainly don't expect you to memorize all the different specifications for three different types of cable. Uh, but let's just go through each of these. So the... Uh, Top here, I have twisted pair. That's going to be what you think of when you think of a traditional Ethernet cable. It's going to have uh, four pairs of two uh, individually wrapped cables. And basically, uh, there's different specifications ranging from CAT3 all the way up to, I believe, CAT8 now. And depending upon you know various things, you can get different considerations with it. For example, 
um, you can get plenum rated cable that allows you to run it through spaces in an attic. And the benefit of something like a plenum rated cable is it's typically going to be shielded against you know, any sort of uh, interference that would otherwise um, could be a problem. And another advantage of things like plenum rated cable is that if there's a fire, um, the cable is unlikely to spread the fire. And also it's going to be unlikely to do things like um, you know, have any sort of toxic fumes. So other types of cable that are twisted pair, they may not have those things. They could be subject to uh, any sort of interference, particularly things like a CFL light bulb causes a lot of interference. Um, speakers can cause interference. Uh, lots of different things can. Um, that's going to contrast a little bit with a coaxial cable. Uh, coaxial cable is basically just a single strand of very thick cable. Uh, we typically see this in things like a cable TV. Uh, that's going to be using a coaxial cable to get the signal. Um, of course, this can also be used for Ethernet signal as well. Um, so basically, it's it's pretty similar in that, you know, depending upon the specification of the specific cable, it can be faster or slower. Uh, but, you know, the, both twisted pair and coaxial cable are using um, some sort of electrical signal, basically, to transmit whatever data they have. Uh, that contrasts with fiber optic cable. Uh, fiber optic cable does not use any sort of electrical signal. Instead, it uses a light signal. So if you get a piece of uh, fiber optic cable, and assuming it's on, you can actually look at it and you'll see a red light. And that is the signal, basically. So uh, because it's not using any sort of electrical uh, signal to pass the data, it's going to be completely free from any sort of interference. Uh, it doesn't matter what type of fiber optic cable, Fiber optic cable is not subject to interference at all, whereas both coaxial and twisted pair can be subject to it. Uh, even shielded uh, cables can be uh, subject to interference. Uh, of course, they'd have a reduction in the amount of interference they'd experience, but they could still be subject to it. Um, but, you know, when we talk about fiber optic cable, um, it's going to be very beneficial in that, in a lot of cases, it can be used over great distances without the need to boost the signal. Uh, again, you know, it's going to depend upon the specification of fiber optic cable. Some fiber optic cable require, uh, you know, the signal to be boosted every uh, 100 yards. Same thing with twisted pair. Most twisted pair is rated for about 100 yards, as is coaxial. But there are other specifications of fiber optic that can go, you know, kilometers on end without needing to have any sort of additional um, kind of boost happen to them. And what I mean by boost is just basically repeating the signal over a powered device. So uh, it's pretty common uh, to have that happen with twisted pair. Um, basically, if you were doing a building layout and you had a building that was more than 100 yards by 100 yards, you'd probably have multiple distribution centers where basically you're just taking the signal out of one switch that's powered into another switch that's powered. So there's ways around it. Uh, but certainly, you know, going over large distances, you would probably want to use fiber optic cable. Um, the cost of the cables are going to be similar. Uh, the main difference is going to be the cost of the tools to work on them. Uh, with twisted pair and coaxial cable, it's very inexpensive to pick up tools to work on them. Uh, however, fiber optic cable is going to cost you hundreds of dollars to find a tool set that will allow you to do basic things like terminate an end of a cable, um, splice a cable, any sort of thing like that. So that's kind of some of the basic considerations there. Again, you know, the book, I'm going to heavily disagree with it on you know, saying that fiber optic cable is faster. Uh, fiber optic cable typically has slightly lower latency, that's true, but you're talking about one or two milliseconds difference over, you know, a mile of cable. So I don't think it's really uh, fair to say that it's faster or slower. You know, there's fiber optic cable that's only rated for 100 megabits per second, and there's twisted pair cable that's rated for 10 gigabits per second. So Certainly, I mean, I don't think it's logical to say that one is faster than the other without, you know, specifying the individual specification. Uh, any questions so far? So again, if I were to ask a test question, I could certainly ask something like, which of these is most likely to be able to, you know, transmit a signal for 800 meters without issue? That'd be a fair question. Uh, I could also ask a question like, which one of these is less, uh, least likely to be subject to interference? It's also a perfectly fair question, because that's not subject to the individual specification of cable. Uh, whereas if I ask a question like, which of these is fastest? You, you, don't, you can't really answer that. So 
that's kind of how I like to think about that. Let's talk a little bit about different network protocols we use. Uh, so Ethernet protocol is going to be used to communicate uh, kind of locally across a network. Um, not going to ask a whole lot about that. But then when we start talking about you know communicating over the internet, we're going to use something called TCP/IP, uh, Transmission uh, Control Protocol uh, slash Internet Protocol, and that basically just allows us to access information on websites, um, you know, access any other information online. And uh, I'm not going to go too far in depth into you know anything about it. Um, just kind of know that's what enables a lot of the web technologies. Uh, in addition to that, we have the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, that's used for websites in particular to basically convey information to be able to you know provide that to people on demand is basically what that's for. It's a standard. So uh, one thing I will kind of go into a little bit more detail about is the OSI model. Uh, and what this is, this is a model that kind of shows how information is transmitted across a network. So uh, basically, what we have is we have seven layers here, and the eighth layer would be. Uh, up here above the application layer, and that will be the user layer. So basically, think of that as layer eight. You know, the user sitting in front of their computer, they're going to be interfacing with layer seven, which is the application layer. So the application could be something like a web browser, it could be something like uh, maybe the Teams application you all are using right now. Uh, lots of different applications. And then from there, you know, it's going to be presented to the application. So that's going to be the presentation layer. There's a session layer, uh, but then, you know, once you actually go into the segment layer, that's when you actually uh, go from just having, you know, large amounts of information to segmented packets. This is where we actually build the packets. Is in the segment layer, and then the packet layer, we actually add on to the packet. We say, what's the destination? You know, where is it going to go? Where is it from? That's going to go inside the the packet layer here, where we're actually determining the path it's going to take. Uh, then in the actual uh, frames layer, that's where we do things like on a local level. This hasn't left our local network yet. We're determining which device it's going to go to. And then in the bits layer, we actually take that packet and we actually physically uh, send it to wherever it's going. And then, of course, this goes both ways. So it goes from the user to where it's going and then where it's going to back to the user. So... I'm not going to ask any specific questions about the different layers on here. That's certainly something you cover in advanced networking classes if you're interested in it. But that's basically uh, how this works, is that you have the user interacting with the application, and then it kind of goes and basically forms a packet, has the destination on it, it actually goes there. So we're going to talk about some different approaches uh, to having a client-server relationship. So what a client-server relationship is, is saying that you, know, you have individual clients that are interfacing with a server. So the server is often going to have maybe files on it that's needed, maybe email server, maybe it's going to have um, you know, other sorts of information, maybe it's going to have applications that the clients are using. Whatever the case is, is that basically there's information that's stored on the server for a large amount of clients. So there's three main approaches we can use here. Uh, the first one would be the zero client approach. And in the zero client approach, we have devices on the network that have a minimal amount of things on them. So that is to say that imagine you had a computer and you didn't have an operating system installed locally on it. Instead, you signed on and it pulled down the operating system from the server. So the server is running the operating system and it's basically just serving it up to the zero client. Now, this is actually a technical term, believe it or not. Uh, it's not... Uh, certainly not to be offensive or anything like that, but that's going to contrast with a fat client. A fat client has almost everything installed locally on it. Uh, so this is like what you think of when you think of a traditional desktop PC. It's mostly a fat client because almost everything you're using is installed on it. Certainly your applications are installed locally on it. Certainly your operating system is installed locally on it. Most of the files you're using are likely stored on the disk that's inside the computer. So that's a fat client. But then there's something in between those two. That's a thin client. So in a thin client, um, some things are stored locally on the device. Some things are stored on the server. Uh, particularly things like applications, they're almost always going to be stored on the server, whereas maybe the operating system itself would be stored locally. Um, that's going to be pretty common in a lot of enterprise applications where they have uh, sensitive information they don't want to have on a device. 
course, you could also just encrypt the device and remove a lot of the issue of having uh, information stored on a local device. But that's certainly a separate issue. Um, that's what these three things are. So uh, again, you know, this is a case where if I were going to ask a test question, I'd probably focus on the things that can be easily differentiated, like zero client and fat client. So just know that uh, as you move from zero client to fat client, the amount of uh, information that's going to be stored locally on the machine is going to increase. And the amount of processing that's done locally on the machine as opposed to on the server will increase. So that contrasts with this uh, technology called peer-to-peer. So in peer-to-peer, -peer, there is no kind of dominant um, party that has more information than another. Uh, in peer-to-peer, -peer, basically, different devices store different things, and other people can request them as needed from the devices. Uh, this is common in a lot of file sharing technologies. Uh, it's common uh, you know, in some other, yeah, basically just file sharing is probably going to be the main use you're going to see this. Um, uh, that's pretty much what there is to say, you know, is that, you know, there's not going to be a traditional server that has, you know, maybe certain tasks assigned to it. It's going to be all devices that basically have the same privileges assigned to them. Uh, so any questions so far? Certainly feel free to jump in at any time with any questions. Uh, so right now I would play a video normally. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this show. IT crowd, uh, but it's pretty uh, pretty good show. Uh, of course, I can't recommend it, uh, but you know it's uh, used to come on. And uh, basically, the whole premise is, is that it's it's about an IT department inside of a company. And basically, what's happening here is uh, the two IT employees convince their boss that there is actually a button that uh, kind of does everything with the internet, and uh, she believes them. Uh, so that's kind of the whole uh, kind of thing here. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of just uh, something kind of introduced the network and, you know, different types of Internet. Or not different types of Internet, but different types of networks, I should say. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about these. So an intranet would be a network that is only for internal company use. Uh, there's going to be maybe files stored on it locally that are only accessible to people within the uh, firm. Uh, that's going to contrast with an extranet. I think last class or the class before we talked about, you know, some of the different ways to kind of exchange information on a supply chain. And I mentioned an extranet where you have maybe different people inside of the, or different firms rather, inside of an industry, all having access to the same uh, extranet. That's one example of this. Another example could be uh, maybe instead of having all the firms in an industry, maybe to have all the firms across the supply chain. Basically, you have different parties. They're not the same firm but they have some sort of thing in common. And that thing in common is that they all access information on the extranet. And then that's going to contrast with the internet. So the internet is basically anyone can access the information that's on it. Um, so there's lots of information posted. There's lots of different websites. Um, it's basically freely accessible. There's no, there is no um, you know, need to really sign into anything. To, well, there can be. But for the most part, you know, we think about traditional internet. Um, you know, anyone can get on it. You don't have to have, you know, any sort of clearance. You don't have to have any sort of account to access information freely available on websites. That's not to say that there can't be websites that require login. I should be more clear in saying that. But that's kind of the difference there. So inter intranet is going to be only available to a single firm or a single organization. Extranet is going to be available to several firms or several organizations. And internet is going to be freely available. A little confusing, but you'll definitely see at least one or two test questions over that. Uh, so make sure that you kind of uh, understand those. And, you know, with the Internet, there's a lot of different things we can do with it. Uh, you know, we're not limited to just using it for, you know, basic web browsing, you know, basic cat pictures, whatever. There's certainly a lot of uses we can have with it. So, you know, the most basic use is probably communication. This could be communication of ideas, communication of, uh, you know, pictures, communication of text. Um, video communication, you know, right now, uh, we're using it in an educational setting. Uh, you know, I'm providing a lecture over it right now. And, you know, this can also kind of aid in collaborative tasks, you know, meeting with people, um, kind of working out different uh, plans, you know, uh, you know, kind of sharing ideas, you know, like I talked about um, entertainment as well, you know, certainly there's lots of videos online. Um, certainly, that's probably pretty entertaining. Um, there's also lots of other entertaining content. Uh, and then lastly, you know, you can certainly use it for research. 
Uh, maybe you have a problem at home uh, and you maybe have like a sink that has a leak. You can certainly look up information about it and get information on how to fix it. It's so one example of research. You do the same thing with a car. Um, you know, you could research and, you know, use research pretty much anything online. So I, I think we all know what the Internet's used for. Uh, but just kind of wrap things up. So we've got one more chapter to do. But just kind of wrap things up. We talked about different uh, network. We talked about enterprise network considerations. We talked about the Internet. And we also talked about some uh, network applications. So any questions so far? Any questions about anything at all? All right. Uh, well, don't worry, I do have some discussion questions at the end. Uh, just kind of make sure that everyone gets some uh, opportunities to participate. Um, so today, uh, participation will be worth four points since there's two chapters instead of the usual two points. So I'd certainly encourage participation as we go. Uh, but now we're going to talk about wireless mobile computing and commerce. So just kind of talk about uh, you know, some of the basic topics and introduce them. As the name implies, we're going to first talk about wireless technologies. You know, how do you communicate using wireless devices? Well, we're going to cover that. Uh, then we'll talk about mobile computing, you know, some of the different uh, technologies associated with that. Uh, then we'll also cover Internet of Things. So right off the bat, you know, just jumping into the different wireless technologies, uh, here's a list of some pretty common ones. You know, Wi-Fi, that is to say, you know, the 802.11 standards, you know, for my IEEE. Uh, using uh, basically network communications over a pretty standardized way allow us to use lots of different types of devices. Uh, smartphones, tablets, laptops, some desktops, uh, gaming consoles, televisions, um, even some refrigerators. You know, we can easily uh, have those devices get access to the internet and allow us to do lots of cool things. Uh, then we also have radios. So there's lots of different types of radios. You know, we're talking about what a radio is. It's basically just a device to transmit or receive, well, I should say and or receive, signal wirelessly. So a Wi-Fi antenna is technically a radio. Uh, we also have, you know, traditional sorts of radios, um, you know, AM, FM, Spectrum, that sort of thing. Uh, we have radios where we can use, like, ham radios, communicate with people across the world pretty easily. Um, just a ton of different options we have with radios. Uh, cellular, of course, uh, pretty widely used. I'm going to go off and assume that everyone has a cell phone by now. Uh, at least everyone who would be taking a class in 2020. I mean, I'm sure there's some people, you know, who don't have them. But, you know, most people probably do. And that allows us to communicate um, in a lot of different ways. You know, we can certainly use voice calls. We can use text messages. Um, you know, just a multitude of ways. You know, anything that you could do on the Internet, you can also do across a cellular signal nowadays. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to cover a little bit about satellite technology. Um, not a whole lot, but certainly some basic things kind of regarding it. Uh, so, you know, with uh, wireless computing, and particularly Wi-Fi, has a lot of advantages for organizations as well as for individuals. Uh, probably the most basic is that it's going to be highly scalable. So what that means is that as you kind of grow as an organization or as your technology kind of advances, you can easily upgrade a wireless network. That is to say that basically, there's only going to be a handful of places you'd have to upgrade, uh, which is going to be very beneficial. So you think about a building maybe the size of, um, I don't know, let's use a retail store like Walmart. They probably have four or five access points inside, their, come inside of each store. So if they have a location, they might have four or five access points in it. It's going to be pretty easy to upgrade those four or five access points. All you have to do is just take the old one down, plug the new one in, provision it, you're good to go, basically. Um, that's going to contrast pretty heavily with a wired network. Imagine if you had to um, basically pull all new cable for a building, and it may have you know, hundreds of different network ports inside of it. So that'd be quite costly and quite difficult to do as well. So... Those are some basic kind of considerations there. You want to consider how scalable the technology is. Wireless technology is going to be very scalable. Uh, there's only going to be a handful of places you have to upgrade. In addition, uh, a lot of times these are going to be very long-range devices. Uh, you don't have to have a whole lot of them. And, you know, for the most part, you're going to be able to kind of send a signal a very long distance. So that's going to be very beneficial. And, you know, kind of in contrast to wired technology... Uh, wireless technology is very easy to install. It's very inexpensive to install. It's also very inexpensive to purchase. 
So if you're only going to be purchasing wireless technology, uh, you may be able to pick up an enterprise access point for you know um, as little as two hundred dollars a piece. In some cases, you're going to be spending you know five hundred to maybe a thousand dollars per access point, but that's going to be substantially less expensive than a wired solution. So if you had, let's say you had two hundred fifty employees, so two hundred fifty employees all going to be accessing a network, and if you had to drop an ax, if you had to use an access point. Enterprise uh, access points can probably support between 50 and 100 devices pretty comfortably. Um, a lot of times they can support up to 250, but you can certainly run into issues depending on how often they're actually going to be using the network. So let's just say you'd have to buy five access points. Say you spend 500 bucks a piece, and let's say installation is another, let's just say 100 bucks to keep it simple. So you're basically looking at spending 3,000 bucks. Now you contrast that with if you had to drop 250 uh, cables to allow people to access a wired network. Um, here the installation for each of those is going to be at least $10 per port. Uh, in addition to that, you have to purchase at least five different switches. Um, it's going to get pretty costly. You know, an enterprise network switch is going to be at least you know, two or three hundred dollars, you're looking at buying five of those. Um, you know, it's going to be well in excess of three thousand dollars, you know, just to just to get that. And then, you know, in addition to that, you're, you're missing out on the fact that you could upgrade five places versus upgrading 250 if you ever had to. So uh, it's just going to be uh, something that's going to be very beneficial. And, you know, uh, another thing to consider is a lot of times you may be in a building that doesn't have any sort of uh, network ports done in it. Particularly think about a building built before, say, 1990. You know, it's pretty unlikely to have any sort of network ports. At best, you might have a couple telephone jacks here and there. Uh, so, you know, doing those modifications, you know, it can be uh, pretty difficult to do. Sometimes you might have to remove drywall. Sometimes you might have to remove plaster. Um, you know, it just depends on the construction of the building as to how you would actually go about it. But, you know, pretty much any way you would do it, it's not going to be a simple task. So that's where wireless kind of provides us uh, fewer modifications. I'm not going to say that it has no modifications because to get the um, to get both power and uh, some sort of network signal to the access point, you're going to have to have at least one cable. Uh, but certainly one is fewer than you know 250. So so as we kind of think about this, you know, we think about what wireless technology does. We go back to something like Portus Five Forces, where we're reducing the barriers to entry that's going to enhance the threat of new entrants inside of a market. So as we're making the uh, market less expensive to enter, it's going to pretty much, in most cases, um, enhance the amount of uh, competitors inside of a market. So what that's going to do to rivalry overall is it's going to increase it slightly. Um, not to say that you know, wireless technology has led to you know, no monopolies, everything has 50,000 competitors, but certainly, on the whole, this will in some ways aid the reduction or aid in kind of the reduction of monopolistic forces within an industry. So that's pretty much what we're talking about when we're talking about this. Uh, but then the devices themselves also offer several advantages to both customers and uh, individuals and uh, firms in particular. So one of the most basic advantages is portability. You know, if you're using a desktop device that uses a standard ethernet port for its network connectivity, you're not very mobile. You know, certainly you're going to be sitting at a desk probably and you're going to be doing work and that's perfectly fine. But wireless technology allows you to not be limited to sitting at a desk. You know, if you wanted to go walk down the hall and write out emails, you can. You know, if you want to um, go outside and work for a day, you can. You know, that's certainly something you can do with wireless devices. Uh, on the whole, wireless devices are also going to be pretty inexpensive. You know, we talk about smartphones, pretty inexpensive for what they do. Uh, we talk about things like laptop devices, pretty inexpensive. Now you can make an argument that per performance, um, you're better off with a desktop. And that's a very fair argument. But that kind of comes into the next point, which is that most of these wireless devices are going to be powerful enough for basic office tasks. There will be exceptions. Certainly, there will be things that you cannot do with a wireless device. But on the whole, they're certainly going to be powerful enough for most things. You know, we talk about word processing. Um, basic sort of spreadsheet work. Uh, it's going to be perfectly fine for that. So some of the basic kind of advantages they provide. 
but there's also going to be some disadvantages. Um, so when we're talking about wireless devices, uh, there's going to be a lot of interference. So there's a very limited kind of spectrum that is allotted for wireless devices. Uh, and there's going to be more than just, you know, Wi-Fi devices on a particular spectrum, particularly if we're talking about the 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequencies. So that's something we have to kind of uh, consider. Now, having said that, um, most access points are going to be smart enough to, at least enterprise access points, I should say, smart enough to pick a channel that's going to minimize any sort of interference that they're going to observe. But certainly that is something that can take place. In addition, uh, any sort of physical obstruction can reduce the strength of a signal. Uh, in some cases, it can even eliminate the strength of a signal, uh, particularly on a spectrum like 5 gigahertz. It's going to be particularly vulnerable to that, where if you have uh, very thick walls, maybe lead paint can do this as well. Um, you know, any sort of brick material, stone material, uh, that can certainly cause issues where the signal is going to be less readily transmitted. So that's something else to run into. Uh, latency as well. Uh, with wired devices, it's going to be minimal latency. Uh, wireless, though, can introduce some latency. So depending on the distance from the access point, a lot of other factors as well, which we're not going to cover in here, of course, uh, latency could be a bigger concern. Uh, you could be dealing with, instead of just one or two milliseconds of latency, you could be dealing with you know 10 to 20. Uh, and then as well, a lot of people think that wireless devices are ugly. Uh, they think that access points you know, ruin the aesthetic of a building, for example. Uh, that's certainly something to work around. Uh, particularly, this is pretty evident when we see uh, maybe like a new um, sort of cellular tower go up. Uh, sometimes people will complain about it. They'll say, this really ruined the look of the skyline, you know, certainly stuff like that. So that's a disadvantage. I'm not saying it's the biggest disadvantage in the world, but it is a disadvantage. So this is kind of a chart that kind of goes through some different uh, types of wireless media. So we have a, the top here, we have microwave. This is going to be typically used for building to building communication where we don't want to, or we're, I wouldn't say we don't want to, but we're not able to, we either don't want to, or we're not able to, let's say that, um, use some sort of a cable for that, um, you know, sort of communication. So this could be maybe buildings that are separated by a busy road that we can't dig under. And for whatever reason, we also can't put it over the road. Uh, this could also be buildings that are more than, you know, just a meter, to, or not a meter, but more than a, you know, kilometer or two away from each other. Uh, we can use a microwave for that uh, kind of physical link. Uh, this is going to provide us a lot of bandwidth, and it's going to be pretty inexpensive to do. I mean, you're talking uh, the tower itself is going to be the most expensive part by far. Um, but, you know, it's depending on what percentage of the work you do yourself, you could be looking at under $10,000 to do. Uh, but the issue with this is that it's going to have to have a direct line of sight. It's also going to have to be very carefully positioned because this is going to be a directional antenna. So most things we think of are going to be omnidirectional, meaning that it doesn't really matter where the device is oriented, but this has to have direct line of sight. So that's certainly a big consideration. Um, satellite, of course, is going to be pretty similar in that it has to have a direct line of sight, but... Uh, unlike uh, microwave, it's going to be pretty omnidirectional. So it's going to provide us lots of large amounts of bandwidth and cover basically the entire world, which is hugely beneficial. Uh, but the issue is that it's going to be pretty expensive. You know, launching a satellite, it's not a cheap thing to do. I mean, you're talking, uh, you know, at least hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, millions to launch a single satellite. I'm not even sure what the kind of approval process you need to do so. I'm sure there is some, though. Uh, and then we also have infrared down there. Uh, infrared is going to provide very minimal bandwidth. It's also going to require a line of sight. And, you know, it's not going to really be used for a whole lot because there's really no security with it either. Um, you know, anything can see the infrared and anything can, you know, kind of access it in that way. Uh, so any questions so far? I know we covered a lot of material so far. So any questions? All right, well, certainly feel free to hop in at any time. But kind of talking a little bit more about satellites, um, there's really three major uh, kind of orbit patterns to be aware of. So I have a little graphic here. It shows some of the different orbit uh, patterns of you know satellites we can see. So way far out here at the very edge of this is the geostationary orbit. Now, this is going to provide us with several advantages and several disadvantages. So first, when we're talking about this, 
we can have maybe six to eight satellites that can provide global coverage. So we don't have to have a whole large amount of satellites. And, you know, the issue with this, though, is that while they can provide us with global coverage, uh, basically covering the entire globe, um, this is going to be uh, something that's pretty costly to launch the satellites that far. And in addition to that, the latency is going to be pretty substantial. You're talking, you know, probably a second or two of latency. So it's definitely going to be noticeable and it's not going to be usable for every task. Then when we get closer to the Earth, we have mid-Earth orbit, the MIO right here. And basically, this is about 10,000 kilometers away, as we can see. It's going to have a lot less latency than the geostationary orbits do. But it's, uh, it's going to take more satellites than geostationary does to cover the entire face of the Earth because you're closer to it. So, you know, if you have a sort of spherical object and you're shining a flashlight onto it, the further the flashlight is, you know, basically the, the more uh, kind of surface area of the sphere that's covered with light. But the flip side to that would be that it would, uh, you know, take longer if there were a signal. I mean, it's not going to take much longer in terms of, you know, a spherical ball and, you know, a satellite that's a couple inches versus a couple feet away. But, you know, if you're talking about uh, the size of the Earth and a satellite that's, you know, three or four times as many kilometers away, that's going to make a pretty substantial difference. Uh, then we also have highly elliptical orbit here. Uh, highly elliptical orbit is a little bit uh, different in that it's kind of a more variable path that it takes. Uh, as the name implies, it kind of orbits in an elliptical pattern. Sometimes it's going to be pretty close to the Earth. Sometimes it'll be pretty far from the Earth. Um, typically, we think of that as being kind of in between uh, middle Earth orbit and low Earth orbit. So low Earth orbit is the one that's closest to Earth all the time. Uh, it's going to provide pretty minimal latency. Uh, you're talking sub 100 millisecond latency. Uh, but the downside to it is that it's going to require a huge amount of satellites to provide global coverage. Uh, so that's pretty much what we talk about when we talk about the different patterns. We have geostationary, which is furthest away, mid-Earth orbit, kind of in the middle, and then we have low Earth orbit, which is closest to Earth. So does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about it? Uh, you'll certainly see at least one or two exam questions that kind of make sure uh, just kind of see, you know, that you understand, you know, the differences in latency between these two. So geostationary would have the highest latency, but it would need the fewest amount of satellites to have full coverage. Uh, so you're kind of okay, looking... What was that H-E-O? -E yeah. That's going to be a highly elliptical orbit. Okay. So it's basically just going to be an orbital pattern that's going to be in the shape of an ellipse. It's going to continually kind of go around. Um, but it's going to kind of vary in the latency because it's basically operating in between uh, kind of mid-Earth orbit and low-Earth orbit. Okay, any other questions? Feel free to hop in. But, you know, looking towards the future, uh, it's very possible we'll continue to see, um, you know, satellite technology kind of grow and kind of become more popularized. Uh, one of the companies associated with Elon Musk, SpaceX, claims that they will be launching, um, you know, some sort of a satellite communication for uh, internet, and they're going to be using low Earth orbit. So the idea is that they will have global coverage for uh, pretty low cost. Uh, I think they said their target price is about $25 a month um, to have low Earth orbit. So it's going to have low latency, but certainly uh, more latency than other uh, competing providers would have. So uh, I don't think it's launched yet, but, you know, in the future, it's certainly something to, you know, see how it kind of plays out. But with wireless devices, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to intercept a wireless signal. Uh, you can just be sitting somewhere and you can intercept a lot of wireless signals. Um, so, you know, that's certainly something to consider. So uh, some of the basic wireless threats would be things like a rogue access point. And a rogue access point is just going to be an access point that's on a corporate network, but it's not sanctioned by the corporation. So this could be maybe an employee setting up an access point in their office. Um, this could be um, you know, someone malicious setting up an access point, but it's not inherently malicious. Um, it's just something that could be a threat. So you know, certainly it could be unintentionally uh, causing any sort of problems, you know, particularly things like interference with the corporate network. It could be causing things like um, 
you know, bypassing any sort of filters that the network has. Uh, could be doing lots of things that could be problematic for an organization. Uh, that's going to contrast with Evil Twin. Evil Twin would be where there is a access point set up that is uh, basically set up to appear to be uh, some organization's access point. But in reality, it's collecting data. Maybe it's collecting websites that people are visiting. And it could even be doing worse than that. It could be doing more than collecting information. It could be presenting you know, false web pages uh, to whatever devices are accessing it. So with rogue access point, we can easily kind of mitigate that by having policies on our corporate firewalls to basically not serve a device that is acting as an access point unless it's one of our access points. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to go about that, but it's it's pretty common to do inside of industry. Uh, Evil Twin, there's really only one way to kind of um, mitigate that, and that's going to be through the use of certificates. So any access point could be called anything. And, you know, devices, unless they're using certificates to authenticate that the access point is what it says it is, um, you know, you can connect to it thinking that it is whatever network you believe it to be. So... You know, again, we just kind of mitigate that by using certificate-based authentication, as well as you know other types of authentication with the. But you know, certainly to mitigate that particular threat is what I'm kind of trying to uh, say there. Uh, then war driving is a threat where basically you kind of drive around town, you drive around some area, or you don't even have to drive. You can certainly do this walking. Um, I guess it'd be called war walking if you're doing that, but that's a that's a bad joke anyway. Um, and what you'd be doing is you'd be scanning for certain uh, you know, characteristics of networks. You'd be looking at what security protocols they're using, you'd be looking at where they're located, um, you know, possibly seeing other things, what sort of uh, signal strength do they have at certain places, just kind of collecting information about networks. Um, eavesdropping uh, would be where you're actually signing on to unsecured networks and just seeing what kind of traffic goes across them. Uh, maybe you're collecting the information. And, you know, maybe you're using it for malicious purposes, maybe you're not. Uh, but the, the whole concept of eavesdropping is, is that you're collecting the information. And then lastly, RF jamming would be where you actually, um, basically, you purposely introduce interference so that legitimate devices are unable to communicate. Um, this is used from things like cell phone jammers. Um, it's used in a lot of different types of devices where the whole premise is, is that you're basically preventing legitimate communication. So... That's pretty much what you see there. Now next, I'm going to talk specifically about the Wi-Fi standards. Um, the good news is that you don't really have to memorize them. Uh, as you can tell here, this is an older chart here. Um, doesn't even have the full, uh, fully ratified version of uh, 802.11ac. Uh, of course, we know now that we're on Wi-Fi 6. So it's an older chart, but it has the information. Uh, this is kind of interesting to look at because we see um, 802.11a and 802.11b, we actually got slower going from A to B. Now, there's some debate about which one truly came first. Uh, basically, what happened is, is that B technically was in research for longer than A, but A managed to make it to market just a little bit before B did. Uh, so they used uh, pretty different technologies. Um, for the most part, what we see is we see a pretty steady pattern where as time progresses, you know, the communication speed will increase, you know, it'll become faster. So, uh, you know, as we go from 54 megabits per second uh, to 600 megabits per second, that's a theoretical speed, of course. Uh, you know, going to Wi-Fi 6, we'll see, you know, well above one gigabit per second, um, probably, you know, even beyond that on certain devices. Um, so that's basically all you need to know there. Uh, the typical range... Um, I would say that's probably going to be uh, pretty theoretical. It's going to depend upon a lot of factors. Um, you know, depending on the type of uh, access point you're using in particular, it's going to have a huge impact on it. You know, what sort of obstructions do you have? Um, you know, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the typical range, but really just the speed is going to be the, the main difference between any of these. So that's really all you need to know. Uh, talk about some other types of wireless technology. Of course, we have Bluetooth. Uh, so Bluetooth is going to be used for you know basic communication. Um, particularly, it's used in a lot of audio devices, headphones. Um, your car probably has a Bluetooth connection if it's you know not from like 19 you know 90s or anything like that. It probably has some sort of uh, Bluetooth interference where you can connect your or interface rather not interference. It probably has so you can connect your smartphone to it and you can you know stream music whatever you want to do. 
uh, near field communication uh, that's going to be used for you know basically transmitting tiny amounts of information over a very short distance, um, hence the term near field. Um, it could be used in like credit cards, could be used in access cards, um, or basically, you know, we can easily kind of transmit just a tiny amount of information at a very rapid pace though. Uh, Zigbee and Zebra, we're going to talk about in a couple slides. They're going to be used for IoT devices, and we'll talk about some specifics with that. But kind of moving towards uh, mobile commerce, um, this is probably a pretty basic review for a lot of people, but you know, certainly it's good to kind of have a good refresher. So, you know, with mobile commerce, we can do a lot of things. Uh, we have, you know, the ability to pay using mobile devices, particularly things like a mobile wallet. So there's a Google wallet, there's Apple Pay. Um, I think Samsung has one as well. Um, but certainly the whole premise is, is that you just have a mobile device. You know, imagine if your smartphone was also the keys to your car. Um, you know, certain car models are kind of pushing that out. Uh, same thing with if your smartphone was also your wallet. You know, that'd be, uh, you'd really have a lot fewer things in your pockets, I suppose. Uh, or purses or whatever you use to, you know, carry everything in, certainly. Um, then we could also use things like location-based applications where depending upon where we are, we get contextual information. So this is going to be common for things like weather. You know, depending on where we are, we get weather updates. Um, this could also be used for marketing purposes. You know, imagine you had the ability to push a notification when people were getting near your business. So maybe you say, hey, you know, glad to see you're driving by. Why not stop in for 20% off coffee? Um, that sort of thing uh, will likely kind of continue to increase in prevalence, particularly uh, with mobile devices and social networks in particular, kind of having that ability to do so. Uh, and then lastly, telemetry. Uh, just basically, you know, kind of the whole premise of, you know, sharing the information. So depending on what a device is doing, it can share information. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of this in particularly the retail sector, where you know certain enterprise access points, they're actually using Bluetooth signals, the devices that are connecting to them, to uh, kind of track where they are in a store. Now, you know, as you can imagine, that certainly opens up some privacy concerns, and I'm not here to say whether that's a good or bad thing to do for companies, uh, but. Um, in response to that, I believe the latest versions of iOS will, um, you know, kind of stop that. They'll have a randomized Bluetooth ID so that basically you're not able to track an individual. You're instead tracking a device that changes every time, you know, basically every 24 hours it gets a new one. So certainly, I mean, that's a certain thing to consider. Um, you know, it's probably going to be best security practice to disable Bluetooth when you're not using it actively. But, you know, it's certainly something that could be pretty easily done. Now, from a retailer's perspective, I mean, that's going to be pretty beneficial information. You can see what aisles people are going down. How long are they staying on the aisles? Uh, lots of great information. Of course, you could also do the same thing using something like a security camera, where you just basically do a heat map analysis and see, you know, what sorts of things are people stopping to look at, you know, that sort of thing. So lots of great information that we can get. But with that great information, there's always going to be a good discussion on whether that's good or bad to do. So uh, speaking of retail, though, uh, retail environments in particular have a lot of inventory, and they have inventory coming in and out quite a bit. So we can certainly use technology to kind of help us you know, keep track of that inventory. We can use things like RFID, and this is going to be very beneficial for a, you know, particularly like a large distributor maybe, maybe a, um, not just a distributor, but even you know, some sort of retail environment that's probably like a department store or something. Being able to have every single thing inside of a pallet being able to be scanned at once. You don't have to unwrap the pallet. You just basically scan in all of the RFID codes. Uh, it can be hugely beneficial for things like that. Uh, that's going to contrast a little bit with QR codes. Uh, QR codes can have a huge amount of information stored inside them. But the downside to them is that while they have a large amount of information, they're not going to uh, be able to be scanned, you know, if they can't have line of sight to whatever device you're using. So uh, they can be scanned from any angle. That's certainly beneficial, but that's kind of the downside. Uh, an even bigger downside would be a barcode. So unlike uh, QR codes, barcodes have to be scanned from a specific angle. Um, so when we talk about these, they can be pretty common. Uh, you're going to see lots of products having a 12-digit or a 12-character uh, universal product code that basically allows any sort of retail environment to keep track of what they have. 
uh, in a kind of standardized way. So, you know, basically as we move from RFID on down to barcodes, if we did it manually, it'd take even more time. So we certainly would want to consider, you know, the speed in which we can kind of, you know, keep track of everything. So kind of the last thing we're going to cover today is IoT, you know, Internet of Things. And this is where we can do a tremendous amount of things with small devices. So these could be devices like a door sensor to tell you if a door is open. It could be things like a uh, motion sensor to tell you if there's motion in a room. Uh, it could be things like a leak sensor to tell if there's you know, any sort of leaking water. There's just a multitude of devices that we can kind of you know, have that are able to communicate in a lot of times uh, without the internet, but in a lot of times with the internet. So. I don't want to you know, be caught up in the definition that it has to use internet to communicate, because it doesn't. Uh, there are certainly cases in which it would, and there are cases in which it would not. So you know, some of the most basic uses are going to be things like a smart home, you know, having the ability to turn lights on and off, having the ability to know, you know when someone's home, when they're not home, can be very beneficial. Also, things like the healthcare industry can use you know, lots of devices that can kind of centrally communicate, and kind of uh, provide things like alerts, like imagine if a patient is not breathing, you know, it's something you'd need to know. Uh, if a patient's not having a heartbeat, uh, certainly things like that. And, you know, basically they have those devices inside of uh, health facilities. And now, instead of being, you know, kind of, uh, kind of decentralized, they're now more centralized. So the information's kind of sent and it's tracked over time. So, you know, certainly you can see the history of a patient without having to go up to the monitor itself and look at it. Uh, automotive as well. You know, there's certainly lots of automotive sensors within, you know, automobiles and, you know, that's able to uh, kind of communicate and kind of, you know, pass information to, you know, various diagnostic devices, pretty common for that, as well as automotive engineering. So certainly very beneficial. Uh, supply chain management, just knowing what's inside the inventory, you know, what's inside the supply chain is all going to be very important, uh, as well as things like agriculture. You know, so agriculture is going to have things like how much rain is in the, or how much uh, water rather is in the soil. You know, what's the humidity? Uh, what is, you know, the temperature? It's all going to be very important to agriculture. Um, now, could I tell you the specifics of how that kind of plays in? Probably not, but certainly having those devices where they can, you know, kind of communicate in a kind of a mesh fashion where they don't have to have any sort of central hub, they can instead use all the different devices to kind of pass their signal to and from whatever they need to. So two major standards of this are going to be Z-Wave and Zigbee. Uh, the main difference between these two is that Z-Wave is going to be sub one gigahertz and it's going to basically be less subject to interference on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So I talked about Wi-Fi is on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So are Zigbee devices. Um, a lot of uh, phones are also going to be on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, so 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is going to be pretty crowded, whereas sub 1 gigahertz, not going to be so crowded. So that's the main difference between them. But basically, this allows devices to kind of communicate in a mesh fashion. Uh, they're not going to be passing a ton of information between the devices. It's going to be, you know, tiny little bits of status information. But uh, both of these support, you know, encryption. They support uh, lots of different technologies to make sure that information is being transmitted in a safe fashion. So wrap things up, we've got a couple discussion questions next we're going to get to, just to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate today. We covered uh, wireless technologies, we covered you know, basic mobile computing, and we also covered some Internet of Things. So any questions about today? Certainly feel free to jump in with questions. I dropped my pen, so I'm trying to find that. All right. I'm gonna pick up my pen so I can uh, jot down who is um, who's gonna participate, who's participating. Um, certainly, I'd encourage everyone to participate. But here's the first question right here: is how is how can firms use networks? So, who wants to start off and answer how firms can use networks? I'll start. Right. Firms can use networks to communicate across the whole company with example through um, intranet and through um, use of like a grand tracking of inventory and such activities as that. Okay, I agree. That's a great answer. Um, I can uh, add to that. It, like 
it also helps like spread information. Like if you want to give, if you want to give another company some information, or if you want to, you know, relocate it to someone else within your company, it also allows you to be able to do that as well. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, communicating information. Uh, what about application hosting? Anyone want to talk about how applications could be hosted over a network? File storage, anything like that? Yeah, um, it's kind of more secure, I guess. Say if they had everyone's personal information on a file, you know, instead of keeping it in a file area like a file cabinet with a lock on it they could digitally scan everybody's information and keep it in a computer with a very secure passcode and you won't have to worry about you know someone breaching that or breaking in getting everybody's files and personal information it'll be uploaded you know where no one can get it except like the higher people like the ceo or somebody yeah so certainly if they're using proper encryption that would certainly be the case um yeah so th there's a lot of different ways firms can use networks um Let's talk about this question. This is a kind of open-ended question. How has wireless technology changed society? I think it's uh, it changed society, especially when you're communicating with people. You know, back in the day, people would, you know, just see each other in person or walk to someone's house to talk to them, whereas today you're meeting people through social media. Gotcha. That's a great answer. Yeah, I think it's easier to communicate with people like overseas for jobs and stuff like that. Okay. I mean, it's very beneficial, like, especially now during the pandemic and stuff where you can't be, you know, together and stuff. It connects, you know, everybody, not just socially, though, but like professionally. Since we can't all go around each other, you're not subjected to not getting work done. You can all link together online instead of just not at all because you can't physically get together. Certainly. That's a great point. And going off of that, before the pandemic, it made us a lot more mobile. We didn't have to sit at home if we wanted to send an email or at the computer at the job site or anything like that. Yes, I mean, it's, it's truly transformed, I would say, pretty much every aspect of life. You know, it's transformed commerce. It's transformed, you know, um, you know meeting. It's transformed education. It's transformed uh, transportation, even. I mean, certainly... Pretty much everything we do has certainly had a very large transformative role in kind of reshaping that. Um, anyone else want to add anything to that? Well, uh, that's really all I had today. Uh, I do want to ask uh, one quick favor of everyone. Uh, if you will, please uh, make sure that you, uh, if you have the chance to uh, fill out the survey that was sent out from Class Climate. Um, again, just to remind everyone, it's completely anonymous. I uh, just want to encourage you to take the time to do that. Uh, it should be pretty quick. I think it's only about 11 questions. Uh, just gives me a lot of great feedback. Um, so I certainly encourage you to do so. Um, and apart from that, uh, next class we will meet and kind of discuss a little bit about the uh, Cloud Computing Technology Guide and also address any questions at all that you have. So that's all I had today. Uh, I'll stick around if anyone has any questions. Apart from that, I hope you have a great day. One question on the quiz. Is all the quizzes are due tomorrow night at midnight, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So um, make sure that you do them before then, and you shouldn't have any problems there. Okay, thank you. No problem. Have a good one.